We'll be uploading it to our social media outlets uh, shortly after we're all done here today. Uh, you can check our YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook pages if you need links to that, or feel free to reach out to any of the team and we will uh, gladly direct you to a, uh, to a link where this will be posted. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please do feel free to drop them in the chat window as we move along. Uh, we'll do our best to address the questions um, as we're going through the content. However, if we don't get a chance to, uh, don't sweat, we will make sure to address all the questions and comments um, uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, if the chat window doesn't open automatically, there should be a button down, um, down at the bottom of the, uh, of the Zoom uh, program that you're uh, logged into right now. Uh, so please pay attention during the webinar. Uh, we will be asking a skill testing question at the end of the session. Um, the first person to answer correctly will win a $100 Amazon gift card. Um, so with that being said, uh, I will let, uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not done here yet. Um, again, we're very excited to be moving forward with KP Performance and their solutions. Uh, not only do they have proven antenna solutions for any kind of wireless network, but they're constantly innovating and bringing new and exciting products on a consistent basis. And they've been doing this for a number of years, if you're familiar with them. Uh, MBSI Wave here, we're more than happy to help with planning, uh, network design, post and pre-sale support on every piece of a wireless network, whether it's radios, antennas, fiber, towers, etc. Uh, so presenting today on behalf of KP Performance is Michael Inverso. Uh, he's based in San Diego, California. And then we have also Justin Pollock uh, based in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, Kevin is the Director of Sales and Justin is a uh, Senior Antenna Engineer with KP. So with that being said, I will pass the mic over to Kevin and Justin to take it away. I think you mean Mike and Justin. Mike and Justin, I'm sorry. I, I got it. <laughs> I got, I, I've been calling you Kevin all week. I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, that's okay. That's my nickname. Maybe you could use that as my okay, nickname. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> sorry, all right. Let me share. Let, let me share my screen here, and we'll get uh, we'll get Justin uh, all set to go. He Justin will be presenting um, the first part of the presentation, the technical section. So pay attention, everyone. The uh, the question I'll give you a hint. The question, the answer to the question, will be presented during that part of the presentation. So let me share my screen here, and uh, we'll go up here. Oh, I'm going to give control to Justin. And uh, Justin, go ahead and uh, take take it away. Okay. Um, yep. There you go. That's it. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. My name's Justin. A uh, little bit of background about myself. I have a PhD in electromagnetics. Uh, I started with KP in the, a few years ago now. I've, I'm uh, becoming a regular slight, site now at the show. Um, so at the Wisp of America show, Wisp of Palooza show, you'll see me around at our booth. Um, but uh, I have a lot of experience designing antennas, uh, testing them, and also now managing uh, new products. So. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be with this company. It's a very exciting, growing company, and uh, and um, I think you're gonna like what we have coming out in the, in the next uh, year or two. So, uh, just, let's Justin, uh, let me just uh, oh. sorry, Justin, but Justin is also very good at taking uh, complex ideas and uh, making them understandable for those of us that don't have a, a PhD in RF antenna design. <laughs> Please, he's, he's very good at that. Yeah, no, and, and um, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, so hopefully yeah. That, that comes across here in today's talk. Uh, but let's see, we're six minutes behind, <laughs> so let's uh, keep moving. So as, as everyone knows, antennas, um, they're a complex beast. Uh, not There's a lot to, that goes into antenna and a lot that defines it. Uh, on your screen right now, you see some of the different properties, electrical and mechanical properties. Most of the time, we just think about frequency and gain. Um, and, and probably beam width, but we have all these different properties we need to think of. Uh, PIM, third order modulation, very important in L to E. You want to minimize your PIM. Power capability, it's not too big of an issue for us because we have low wattage radios, but if once we get into high wattage radios or, or um, uh, that the carriers, carriers are using, then, then the power capabilities become more important. Uh, front to back, how much power you're going front and backwards, we'll talk about that later. 
Um, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see there's a lot that defines antenna either electrically or mechanically. Um, and, and you can spend a long time investigating each one. But when you're choosing antenna, you have to uh, at least consider each one, how much time you spend to consider them. Uh, that, that depends on, on your application. But antennas, how, what do they do? They, they, they distribute power in, in space. Uh, you put power, uh, electricity into an antenna and it transduces it into a free space wave um, that uh, focuses the power one direction or the other. So here we're showing the azimuth pattern um, of, of an antenna uh, and, and that's in the horizon of the antenna and you can see it, it's uh, pushing power forward. It's like a 60 degree beam width. Um, so we define the beam width as its half power beam width here that's in the blue arc so minus 3 dB is half power beam width so that's where most of your power is being pointed. Um, pattern skew or, or tennis or uh, squint is if your horizontal beam is pointed a little bit off axis maybe 10, 15 degrees, 5 degrees. It typically is about 5 degrees uh, and it gets worse the more uh, ports you add. So for a 4x4 four four antenna or an 8x8 eight eight antenna, you can get um, a little bit worse. But the max for KP antennas is around 5 degrees. Um, elevation down tilt, so that's orthogonal to the horizontal. So this is in the vertical direction and the long axis of the antenna uh, for a sector antenna. And it, it's really, this is how you get your gain as you squeeze the power in the elevation. Um, and uh, it allows you to focus the power in one direction, kind of like a flashlight almost. Uh, you're shining it on one one area on the ground. Uh, so elevation patterns defined by, um, uh, once again, let's see if it's going to click here, the 3 dB beam width. We'll see what the animation catches up. There we go. Um, the And very more, more important things is the electrical down tilt. We'll talk about that in a second. Upper side lobe elevations, um, levels. Uh, so how much uh, suppression do we get of these first upper side lobes, the first, second, third? Um, null filling right below the main axis. There's always a strong null that goes down. It can go down to minus 20, minus 25 dB. If you can fill that in a little bit to minus 10 uh, would be great. Minus 15, I think, is about average. Uh, you can help improve your coverage close to the, the tower. So this is a near-field anechoic chamber, which we use to measure our antennas. Uh, you can see this is an old antenna, you know, old KP logo there. but. Um, it's a very sophisticated and automated system that we use to, to measure antennas uh, inside a shielded room with the uh, uh, absorber material on uh, pretty much most of the surfaces. Uh, so gain, gains are very important. It's kind of defines how how much um, you know you know your your signal to noise ratio, your your received signal strength. Um, but gain it has a um, it's a little bit contentious uh, definition. It's not standardized in, in our industry. Um, it, it is in under industries, and the IEEE does have a standard definition. But let's let's kind of get to how is gain defined. So if you have an antenna that radiates perfectly in all directions, all all uh, three dimensional directions, you have a zero dBi antenna. And this is, um, <clears throat> uh, and when I say zero dBi, this is like a, a, a no. Uh, there's no loss in the antenna at all. And, and in this case, uh, uh, we can just say it has zero dBi. Um, now, once you start focusing power in one direction, uh, you end up increasing the gain. But, but instead of talking about gain, let's talk about directivity. That's actually what I'm talking about here. So uh, directivity is related to gain through loss. So uh, gain is equal to the efficiency of the antenna times the directivity. So when we start focusing power, we're actually increasing the directivity of the antenna, uh, focusing power in one direction. So here we're showing it has a 10 dBi directivity when we start pushing the waves in this direction. Um, but when we start to consider the loss of the antenna, um, that's the efficiency. So uh, usually it's not perfectly uh, efficient and there's some little loss. So what does that do is it actually lowers the gain that you see in real life. So if you have a 50% efficiency on the antenna, you see a 3 dB drop in the gain with, as respect to the directivity. So you actually see a lower gain in the field. Now some vendors actually report the directivity on their data sheet. Some of them report the gain. Um, it, it, and, and it's a little bit difficult to tell which one is on the uh, correct um, until you get into the field and you actually compare it to, to some propagation studies. So it's just something to be, be aware of. Uh, I've seen anywhere from a one, one to three dB inflation of the gain uh, from, from reputable antenna manufacturers. Um, and, and 
one way to know if you know the gain is true is you can ask them okay did you measure the gain with a nist calibrated standard gain horn and and if if they say no yes i don't know what you're talking about um you got to get a good idea of, of if where's the gain and and is it accurate Another way to tell is just to look at these calculations here. Um, you can uh, Google these really quick, but it's uh, relating gain to the size of an antenna and the frequency, or the beam widths and the azimuth and elevation, and they get fairly close. Um, it at least tells you like if if you're going to be if the gain's really far out, if it's if it's accurate or not. Um, and this is the standard gain horn. I think that's a five gigahertz horn. So and. Um, once again, a an, an very important um, parameter for antennas, uh, sector antennas in particular, is the elevation down tilt. So down tilt, we use it to uh, point the, the, your beam in one direction uh, towards the ground, very close or far away uh, from the tower, and you can use that to reduce interference from another cell or sector um, that's maybe five miles away, 10 miles away. Uh, and also uh, the other function is to concentrate your power with where you want to serve uh, your customers. Um, so we, you could you can calculate uh, where you should set down tilt uh, either electrically or mechanically uh, by using these uh, handy little formulas which calculate the inner and outer radius uh, as related to the height of the antenna, the the, the beam width, um, and, and this gets you. It's kind of like a zeroth order approximation gets you to close to where you need to tilt the antenna. Uh, so like I said, you can do it mechanically with the brackets, uh, or you can do it electrically. Um, one way is uh, if buying an antenna that has a fixed electrical down tilt, let's say a four degrees or two degrees, um, or there's more advanced antennas uh, that, that we see the carriers use, um, and they, they have remote electrical down tilt. So you, you have a remote that you can change the down tilt on it electrically, or you have a tuning knob underneath, and that's called manual electrical down tilt. And that knob can tune the down tilt from anywhere from zero to 14 degrees. The issue with those systems is they, they do increase the cost up to 200 to $500. Um, so some of the differences you see between mechanical and electrical down tilting. So mechanical, um, when you're down tilting with the brackets, what ends up happening, um, if you're looking in the plane of the antenna, so if you're 100 feet up with the antenna and you're walking around the antenna in a big circle, you're going to start measuring this pattern that we're seeing here on the top, where the, the field strength is, as you down tilt, the, 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 your received strength is going to drop drastically on the axis of the antenna. But if you look at 90 degrees and 180 degrees, it's actually not dropping at all um, or very little. So what does that mean is, is if you're using down tilt to reduce interference between adjacent cells, other towers that are at the same height as your, your, your one tower you're looking at, your down tilting, you're really not going to get that much uh, noise reduction um, or interference rejection um, at 90 degrees and 180 degrees when you're just mechanically down tilting. You don't see this on the ground. You only see this 100 feet up in the air. And this is called pattern blooming. Um, so that's why electrical down tilt is preferred, where when you down tilt it electrically with fixed electrical down tilt or manual remote, you actually reduce the, the pattern in all directions, all 360 degrees around the antenna as you increase the electrical down tilt. So th this is uh, very important um, when you have many cells close together, uh, such as uh, if you're um, operating a cellular, cellular network um, or a highly dense uh, WISP network. Uh, front to back is a very important uh, characteristic here. So uh, front to back, it defines how much power is radiating forward. Um, with respect to radiating backwards. And, and if you are operating, let's say, uh, four sectors around a tower um, in a two frequency configuration, so that'd be AB, AB, um, you'd want to maximize your front to back as much as you can, such that you minimize interference between those two sectors back to back. But you don't care about just 180 degrees. Um, the, the, the front to back defined at just the 180 degree point, let's say here it says it's minus 40, and you're th thinking, oh, that's a really good antenna. Um, I'm going to have minus 40 dB uh, rejection between these two sectors that are back to back. Uh, no, because you actually have to think of, there's actually an arc around there, which you care about. You're, you're, you're providing service in a 60 degree arc, so plus minus 30 degrees around 180. Um, which you want to see the rejection. So the front to back definition really should be defined to here. And we can see here at the edges of the arc, it's minus 33 dB, the front to back. So this is the, the, um, the uh, difference in signal strength that you would see now between the, the front of your, your uh, antenna and the back of your antenna. 
Um, and this is what the sector behind it will be seeing too. So we, uh, we, we, we pay uh, very close attention to this definition and make sure we define our front to back with respect to it. Another one here is cross polarization. Um, it can be called cross polarization, cross polarization discrimination, CPD, XPD, XPIC, uh, a lot of different ways to say the same thing, but really we're talking about the difference between the, um, your polarization you want, your desired polarization, which is the green, oops, sorry, and the polarization you don't want. So if you're radiating on H polarization, you don't want to be radiating on V, but you end up do rating a little bit on V, it's just how much depends on, on how well the antenna design is designed. So the same thing with front to back, we can define it just at one angle at the main axis at zero degrees. And you can see here the front to back is really good, 32. That's actually pretty typical for patterns antennas. It's usually really good at zero degrees, but then it creeps up off axis. Um, but really you care about how it, the cross pole is across the entire sector. So you should look at uh, here, this is a 65 degree beam width. So we, we actually care about the cross pole uh, difference between um, this green curve and blue curve right at the edges of the sector, which looks like it's the worst. And we can see here it's actually minus 18. So the definition of cross pole um, can drastically change the spec that you're writing down on your data sheet. Uh, polarization. This is actually pretty important. Uh, we're, we're seeing a, a transition now from, uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to happen in, uh, fully in the next five years or so from horizontal vertical uh, to 45 slant. Um, now in this transition period, uh, one thing to say first is the carriers did this a long, long time ago, like 10 plus years ago, they went to 45 slant because they found it had much better propagation characteristics. You can design the antennas much easier um, with 45 slant. Uh, and and I think our, our market, the, you know, uh, the WISP market, fixed wireless market, it is starting to realize this and, and slowly catch on. We see some manufacturers moving towards this, like uh, Mimosa is, um, and Cambium, I think they're, they're look, starting to look at it a little bit more seriously now. But let's say you had a, an antenna that's um, on the AP side, it's 45 slant, but then on the CPE side, it's H and V. There's going to be some mismatch due to the polarization, and that mismatch will drop the gain. But the max polarization or max uh, drop and gain that you can get due to the mismatch in polarization between a horizontal vertical and a 45 slant is minus three dB. That's the max theoretical you can do, minus three. But in reality, that doesn't re usually happen because of multipathing, reflections, all, the, all these neat network propagation effects. Um, the polarization is no longer pure H and V, pure 45 slant. It's somewhere in between. So you end up seeing anywhere from maybe like a half dB drop to one and a half. Uh, it just depends on your propagation characteristics. Uh, so, so it's not the end of the world if you have this mismatch between H and V and 45 slant. You're still going to have an antenna that works. Um, and, and in some cases with some MIMO technology, such as Mimosa, they, they uh, actively advertise that, that it, um, their technology removes any polarization mismatch uh, loss in their receiver chain. So you don't, you don't have to really worry about uh, mismatching the polarizations uh, for that system. Um, so basic principles of a sector antenna. Oh, where's my images? Oh, well, I had a um, bunch of images here that just didn't show up for some reason. Um, let's see if I have, there we go. We'll just do this one. So sector antenna is constructed from uh, multiple antenna elements that are connected together using traces. So here we're showing uh, air suspended stacked, um, uh, aluminum stacked patches. So it's an all, all metal design. It's really low loss. Uh, and and, and be, because we're using all the, uh, all, an all metal design, we can get very high gain out of these, these antennas as opposed to using a PCB. Um, sometimes you just have to use PCB because it, it allows you certain characteristics you can't get with the all metal. Um, but, but the PCB does have some, a small amount of loss associated with it. Uh, which decreases the antenna's efficiency. So um, we, we try to use PCB as, as minimal as we can. Um, and when we do use it, we, we use a high quality PCB that has low loss, which in, um, tries to optimize the efficiency of the antenna as much as we can. <clears throat> so here we're just showing, uh, kind of going out of order because of missing images on the two slides back, but uh, showing the, um, some of our sector antennas from our, you know, the ones we've had for many years. This is a 900 megahertz, a clover leaf design. Um, and this is a, a three gigahertz, 120, might be two gigahertz, 
uh, a 120 degree sector. So the way we can get a true 120 um, is by angling two patches. Uh, I think they're angled maybe there's a 90 degrees in between them here. And um, it allows you to, the we have a combiner behind them. And then, uh, so our weight, our energy gets split between each patch and then they, they both radiate and then they combine in the far field to give you a nice true 120 degree uh, beam width. Uh, it's very difficult to get a 120 without doing tricks like this or um, or actually something like this here uh, where you put walls really close to it. So if you look at a lot of manufacturers, they, they, they may say it's a 120 on the on you know the product description. But if you look at the beam width, it might be closer to 100 or maybe a 90 degree. Uh, so it's just something to be careful with. And then here's our pro line sectors um, on the right. Just an image of our um, two gigahertz uh, 33 degree sector. And it's uh, we, to get the narrow beam width, we use two elements in the horizontal direction, and, and we use these side reflectors here to improve the side lobes. Uh, there's a lot to, that goes into these. Um, they're very well designed and, and very well constructed and fully uh, quality tested. So um, we're very happy with our proline sectors. So I'm just going to go back one slide and see if we can use this. So here's some more basic principles of sector antenna. So to increase gain, what do we do? We increase the number of elements. So we can go from one element, which has, uh, know, let's say, 9 dBi gain, and then you go to 2. Um, every time you double the amount of elements, you increase the gain theoretically by 3 dB. In, in, in practice, it's not a, an exact 3 dB, 3 dB increase because you have additional losses due to the feed network being longer. Um, but uh, most sector antennas are about 8 elements. Some of them are 10 and 12. Um, but uh, the, So the gain for is usually around the 16 to 18 dB mark. Uh, depending on, on the, the efficiency of the antenna for these eight elements. Sometimes we use 10, like I said, and we use that if we want to control the um, elevation side lobes a little bit and, and start to t taper them off. And we need to use 10 elements to do that without reducing the gain too much. So, yeah, now I'm just going to talk about like why you want to use a, a sector antenna. And, and, and really it all comes down to gain and distance. Um, so here we're, we're talking, we're comparing a, a, just a horn antenna to a sector antenna. So one of the things you'll notice right away is the, the sector is a lot bigger, it's a lot longer, and that's what gets at the tire gain. So even though um, maybe, maybe these things, they have the same azimuth beam width, uh, the elevation of the sector antenna will always be much narrower because a horn has a symmetric pattern. Even the asymmetric horns, uh, they, they don't narrow the elevation down to as much as the sector because, I mean, it would just be massive and, and way too much money and, and, and weight. Uh, so, so we talked about the footprint, uh, the beam width is different. Um, horns are typically symmetrical beam widths, uh, sectors are, are not. Uh, the gain, sectors are very high gain. Uh, and, and the last thing I want, want to talk about here is the definition of beam width. So when you look at a sector antenna, the 45 degree sector antenna, we, we always say 45 degrees with respect to the 3 dB beam width, which is the outer dash curve here and highlighted in yellow. Um, and that's for 45 degree, we got a 20.5 dBi gain. But then when you go to a horn and they say it's a 45 degree, that's always with respect to the 6 dB beam width. So that's represented here in red and yellow. And we can see here that uh, you know the gain actually drops off another 3 dB before you get to this beam width here. Uh, so that's one quarter of the power as opposed to our definition, which is one half of the power. So when you're comparing a sector to a horn, you have to actually make sure you're comparing the the actual azimuth 3 dB beam width uh, to, to make, have an apples to apples comparison. And we'll see that right here. So what I'm showing here is a KP 45 degree sector. It's a four port sector versus a two port 40 degree horn and a two port 60 degree horn. And you can see here the sector, um, just because it's you know so much bigger that we can actually get a, a very high increase of gain over the horn antennas. Uh, and we're seeing here, so what is this, uh, 20.5, about a 4 dB increase in gain over the 40 degree horn, which is, and remember the 40 degree horn, that's respects to a 6 dB roll off, where the 60 degree horn um, is actually, if you look at its 3 dB, horn, uh, 3 dB beam width, it's actually 40 degrees uh, written right here. So the true comparison uh, would be to actually compare it to the 60 degree, and we could see if we actually doing that comparison, it's a 7 dB increase in gain. Um, at zero degrees, and also if you look at the um, the edges of the sector at plus or minus 22.5 degrees, it's also another 7 dB increase in gain. 
So it's, uh, you can just see that the difference in gain, uh, and this is drastic, you're gonna get out many more miles with this sector as opposed to a horn. Uh, and also the front to back here on, on the sector, it's, it's uh, comparable to the horn, the 40, and also that's better than the 60 degree. Now you're, you're thinking, well, the horns, you know, they're good for side lobe levels. Um, yeah, they, they are, but the, I mean, uh, here it's hard to see the difference in side lobes because we normalize them with respect to their, their own gain. But here, all the gains normalized to zero dB on the left. And you can see the, the uh, sector uh, in the red is very comparable in side lobe levels. In fact, somewhere, oops, somewhere in between the 60 degree horn um, and the 40 degree horn. So the, uh, the side lobe levels, uh, we spent a long time optimizing them to, to make them really low um, and, and, and uh, at, at least try to, to get very close to what the horns can do, but still have the high gain of a sector. So, you know, I showed all those plots, but what does that mean in real life? Um, just look at these uh, propagation maps that I did quickly. Uh, and you can see here that, uh, you know, the 40 degree horn, yeah, it's reaching out nice and far. Um, whatever, this is maybe six miles. Um, but then the 60 degree horn, it's only getting out uh, three and a half miles. But then the KP sector, it's going out almost the full nine miles here. Uh, and that was just, uh, I don't think I was maxing out the transmit power on this sector. So uh, you could see that the uh, if you want to use a sector, um, you're going to get be able to pick up more clients with that one antenna. Uh, and that's going to add more revenue onto the, you know you know your one capex your one investment. Um, whereas the horns are great if you're going to just serve a small area, maybe the town, um, but you might be missing out on additional clients and additional revenue down the line. So I did this comparison with all the horns uh, and and some other KP sectors. The KP 65 degree sector we saw similar gain increases. Uh, the red curve here it's one two three four dB increase with respect to the 60 degree horn and then the 90 degree horn it's it's like it's a massive increase uh 8 db almost um mimosa actually did this study uh, and they shared this slide with us uh and they're, they're comparing the 60 degree horn to, to kp's old uh, not old just are, are, are well uh well established uh horizontal vertical four port sector and and it, they just show that you can get massive more much more coverage near the edges of your sector with um, um, using the, the sector antenna. I uh, did another one with the 90 degree horn and, and just same story over again. Um, you know, one thing I'd kind of missed out on is, is due to sector antennas, the way they're constructed, we can actually make them four by four, eight by eight, all in the same enclosure with the same mounting point. Where the horns, you know, traditionally they're two ports. I know that um, they're coming up with a four port one for, for cambium there, but uh, I mean, you're starting to get closer to the size of a sector, um, and but and not the same gain when when they're doing that. With the sector antenna, I mean, we can get do four by four, eight by eight, eight by eight dual band, all in the same radome, one mounting point. Reduce your your tower loading, your rental costs, um, and so the, the, there's a number of uh, attractions to using the, the traditional technologies. Um, <clears throat> One thing I wanted to do also was make sure we're comparing to the new asymmetrical horns. Um, and uh, we, did, we did that comparison and we actually found that, uh, you know, we got very comparable results when you're comparing apples to apples. So when you're comparing it, the same 3 dB beam width, which would be comparing to a 90 degree horn, we can see the 90 degree horn actually has a 60 degree 3 dB beam width. Um, you're getting a plus two dBi uh, in gain over the, with the KP sector on axis. And also, if you look at the edges of your sector, you're getting a plus 4.9 dB gain um, at the plus minus 30 degrees. So I mean, it just kind of shows that uh, that uh, um, you know we're we're very comparable to sectors still still to the to these asymmetric horns. Uh, front to back is also very comparable too. And uh, here we're just showing the difference. Um, and it's not as drastic now, uh, but we, there still is a pretty massive difference with the, the, the KP sector over these asymmetrical horns. We're getting out much farther, uh, still being above the 70 dBm uh, RSRP uh, up to about uh, seven and a half miles or so, or no, sorry, six and a half miles. Uh, so, the, And that's it for me. So I'm gonna pass it off to Mike Inverso.
Okay, thanks, Justin. Go ahead and uh, give me control. Okay. I think you just you can just relinquish yep. control. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. And my turn already. I was just about ready to go get some coffee and a scone. So uh, th thanks, Justin, for keeping it right on time. Um, all right. So KP has introduced uh, this year, uh, less than half half the way through the year, a number of new antennas. Uh, and we'll start off with. Uh, three new products in our ProLine series. These are all small angle sector antennas uh, offered in two gig, three gig, and five gigahertz frequencies. At two gig and three gig, uh, the two variants are offered uh, dual port and uh, quad port antennas. As Justin was uh, explaining, these have been uh, designed for uh, um, uh, low side lobes and very good front to back ratios, right? So with these small angles, you can slot uh, uh, you can slot coverage in an area where uh, you may not have a whole lot of subscribers outside of a particular area or where uh, the noise floor might be uh, fairly high and you have a, a little sliver where you can provide some additional service. Uh, in the field, it might look something like this if you're uh, looking to cover 360 degrees. And this is where the front to back ratio that Justin was uh, describing really comes into play. So around this tower, we have eight sectors um, on just two channels, A, B, A, B uh, channel plan. So these are these sectors here are on the same channel, same channel, front to back ratio allows channel reuse in an application like this. So at three gig and two gig, it would look something like this at uh, the 33 degree uh, sector angle. In five gigahertz, it's 45 degrees. And in this case, we would wanna use a ABC channel plan uh, with six sectors providing 360 degree coverage around this uh, particular site. We've introduced also dual band omni antennas. Uh, I'm sure each of you have used or have thought about using our single band on these. They still are very popular items for us. Uh, but uh, we, we designed and introduced uh, dual band on these to allow even more flexibility in cases where maybe your uh, sub count initially is expected to be low uh, and may gain or where you have some subscribers that are near line of sight and others that are line of sight. So in those cases, we have a two gig, three gig variant, uh, two gig, five gig variant, and three gigahertz, five gigahertz uh, variant. Um, performance wise, you might think that uh, um, you would give something up in offering two frequencies in one antenna, but we found in the field that uh, this is not the, the case, and we knew this, of course, in designing such antennas, but uh, we had two customers that were kind enough to provide for us some initial testing out in the wild, and uh, we'll call the first one customer A. Um, essentially, what they did was replaced a KP 2 gig single frequency Omni uh, with a 2 gig, um, I believe a 2 gig, 5 gig, and this allowed, the, oh, sorry, 2 gig, 3 gig, this allowed them to uh, do a couple of things. Uh, the first is offer service on another radio platform, so essentially doubling their throughput in, in and around that tower, uh, at, but at the same time, not give up any uh, performance in their um, uh, original subscribers at two gigahertz. Uh, for another customer, we have some data. This was watch communications. They provided some feedback like this for us. They did the same thing, but they used a two gig, five gig on the antenna. Um, and we called these sections one, three, eight, and nine. It was just some information that they provided for us. It's a 360 degree coverage uh, originally all at two gigahertz. And uh, this is what uh, you'll see this in each of the sections. This is what the uh, subscriber saw on that single frequency on me. When adding the two gigahertz, five gigahertz on the, uh, the performance at two gig stayed roughly the same. In some cases, it improved a dB or two. Uh, but again, they, they had the benefit of adding uh, a second series of subscribers. 
So doubling the throughput around that tower uh, with a single connection point on the tower uh, by um, introducing a dual frequency on the antenna. All right, so you could use, um, in this case, uh, as an example, you could reserve the two gigahertz for subscribers that have near line of sight and put uh, line of sight subscribers on five gigahertz. Dual pole 900 uh, degree Omni antenna. I had, initially I had my doubts about this being a viable product as we have a 90 degree dual polarity uh, sector antenna. Uh, but this came out and uh, really surprised me in, in the number of units that sold right out of the gate. Uh, we sold out of our initial stocking order and um, are continuing to sell this thing like hotcakes, while at the same time not uh, reducing the sales of our nine uh, of our 90 degree sector. So it's been a very successful product for us. The customers realize the benefit of it. Again. Uh, if you are going into an area where you think the initial subscriber count will be low, you put up an Omni antenna, uh, 900 megahertz of course is great for non line of sight applications. And with its fairly high gain allows um, some very large coverage areas and through fairly thick uh, foliage. So some field testing for such uh, an antenna. Um, provide some really uh, good performance numbers um, with uh, uh, with our Yagi antennas, of course, on the subscriber end. Uh, but initially, or uh, uh, essentially, it looks like this around the tower, out to uh, six miles for some of these subscribers uh, down here. It's uh, tough to know how much. Uh, foliage each of these subscribers might be going through, but uh, I think this is a, a great case for uh, deploying such an antenna initially anyway uh, to gain subscribers. All right, continuing in 900 megahertz, we have now a 120 degree dual polarity sector antenna to go along with our 90 degree and uh, our Omni antenna. So as your subscriber base increases on your 900 uh, meg deployments, you can replace the Omni with uh, uh, 320 degree sectors and then uh, eventually perhaps four 90 degree sectors. Um, basically it just allows you uh, much more flexibility when it comes to 900 megahertz. Uh, buzzword in the WISP industry is TV white space. Uh, I realize that in uh, Canada, some of the rules are not quite set or you may not be uh, uh, very active in deploying TV white space yet, but we've come out with a number of antennas that uh, address the uh, growing trend in TV white space deployments. So we have a sector antenna, of course, uh, and two variants, uh, dual polarization and single polarization. Uh, single polarization uh, being used in cases where there are still broadcasters who typically uh, are transmitting on uh, H polarity. So you would use a single polarity V sector antenna in cases where you want to avoid interference. Uh, because these uh, frequencies travel so well. Uh, also, the way you think about the point is a little bit different. You may not put the sector antennas very high on a tower just to avoid um, any potential interference through broadcasters. Yagi antenna, of course, for the CPE end. The nice thing about this is it's a dual polarity and typically uh, the deployment currently is to use two uh, single polarity Yagi antennas that have to be separated uh, by about, I think it's uh, three feet uh, for maximum performance. So this one antenna now replaces two um, and also provides a way to fine tune the reception because you can uh, very easily turn the antenna for either HV or slant polarity or something in between. And you may find that the signal strength actually improves as you align it somewhere 
uh, that's not exactly HV or slant. As with all our Yagis, it's, um, it's uh, uh, coated with a hydrophobic material so that uh, rain, sleet, uh, snow tends to fall off it with it being painted black. If there's some sunlight and, and perhaps some uh, snow on it, it, uh, it tends to warm up and allows the snow to melt off of it. Flat panels you would use in, in uh, aesthetic cases, I suppose. Uh, roughly the same gain as the dual pole Yagi antenna, uh, but uh, perhaps a, a more pleasing design or easier to install design. They're, uh, they're fairly thick, um, but they do provide a, a much lower profile when uh, installing on houses or buildings or what have you. Again, dual polarity. Uh, this is what they look like in real life. Um, over here on the left, this is the dual single polarity Yagi setup. And you can see that this structure now is being replaced by a single dual polarity Yagi antenna. Panel antenna looks something like this and the sector antenna over here. We've been wor working very closely with Redline Communications and uh, have had some great field success uh, testing being done for us. So. The baseline for testing was this setup here and uh, tested against these three types. So we, we, we get this baseline here. Uh, we use the other types of antennas and results uh, look something like this. And uh, just excuse me one second. Okay, thank you. So uh, again, there's, this is the baseline setup, uh, H and V single pole Yagi antennas. Uh, and when compared to these other uh, dual polarity antennas, you get uh, the same performance or better performance in many cases. So we're very excited about this. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, it opens up and becomes a reality for uh, the Canadian market as well. Proline parabolic antennas we introduced uh, last year, and they have really taken off as well. They offer a very clean design, a very high performance design that covers a extremely wide frequency range, 4.9 gigahertz to 6.4 gigahertz. So one advantage to that is, for us is that they can be used all over the world. Uh, where 6.1 gig and uh, the higher high gigahertz frequencies are used without licenses. Um, with such wide uh, frequency range, one might think, well, what happens to my gain values? These have been optimized so that the, the gain over the entire frequency range uh, is very stable. And it's a, it's a nice linear increase from 4.9 to 6.4 gigahertz uh, without any huge spike uh, and the linearity being um, fairly flat. Right? It, you, you won't see a huge jump in gain uh, from one frequency over the other. Uh, side lobes are diminished by where the, uh, the feed uh, sits within the parabola, so that helps. And then front to back ratio is very good as well. You can see here also the, uh, the antenna patterns uh, compared to uh, compared to the uh, Etsy envelopes, which are pretty strict um, specifications. And in each case, the, um, the Proline Parabolic uh, performance uh, exceeds the pattern envelope requirements of uh, Etsy. Proline sectors we introduced also late last year, and uh, we have a number of SKUs that cover frequencies from 2 gigahertz uh, all the way up again through 6.4 gigahertz with many dual frequency sectors as well. Uh, this is just a list of them. I, we don't need to look at each one, but just know that uh, each of the Proline sectors has been optimized for uh, side lobe suppression, front to back ratios, and flexibility for the user, especially when it comes to dual band uh, sector antennas. So like the Omnis, we have uh, 2 gig and 3 gig, 3 gig and 5 gig, 
and uh, soon we'll be introducing these two gig, five gig sector antennas. What's the, uh, uh, what's the advantage of using a, a dual frequency sector antenna? Uh, ease of deployment and flexibility on the part of the operator. Uh, this is a three gigahertz, five gigahertz sector antenna. And over here to the right, you can see all of the radio combinations that might be used when deploying such a sector antenna. Keep in mind, this is, this is a, single, uh, uh, a single attachment on your tower, right? You're paying rent for just a single antenna now instead of two antennas minimum or perhaps four antennas depending on how many connections the, uh, the antenna offers. In this case, it has four ports per frequency. So you can double up radios or uh, you can double up two by two MIMO radios or uh, use two four by four MIMO radios, uh, one in each frequency. Same with uh, two gigahertz, three gigahertz for LTE type equipment like uh, Telrad, Bicells, Nokia, uh, and um, uh, Cambium and so forth. Uh, the same type of thing. Great flexibility. Uh, you might also consider uh, this as an upgrade path. If you don't have the number of subscribers and you wanna use a two by two radio to begin with, uh, on each frequency, you do that. You come back later and add a second radio uh, to each frequency. You've doubled your throughput in that sector in each frequency. Um, and then later on, if uh, radio uh, technology improves like it is doing currently, you uh, replace the two radios with a single 4x4 MIMO radio. And the same here at two gigahertz, five gigahertz. Again, uh, this one being uh, 65 degrees. Well, I got through that fairly quickly, uh, Justin. We have some additional slides in uh, helping determine how to choose a sector, which type to use, and and where. If uh, if you folks are interested, we can go through this. It's another oh, 10 slides or so, and, and we can try to get through it in maybe seven minutes, and that way we have room at the end for the question. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah. I think it's Yeah. Yep, yeah. everyone good with that? All right, Justin, I'll, I'll give control back over to you. Sure. Okay. Good. So um, choosing your sector, it, it, it's, it's kind of straightforward for the most part, uh, but there are some nuances you have to think of. So traditionally, if you wanted to provide 360 degrees of coverage, you, um, you first you know, think of how many uh, sub subscribers you're going to be adding on, and you think, okay, how many radios do I need? So let's say you need four radios to get all those subscribers and meet their data rates. That means you need four sectors, so that means that there should be 65 or 90 degree sectors. 360 divided by four is 90 degrees. Um, but when you move to some uh, more advanced technologies, such as uh, LTE with maybe buy cells, or um, you actually want to maybe dial that back down and, and think, uh, well, those 90 degrees might be overlapping a little bit too much and dial it down to a 65 degree. So that's what we kind of suggest when you, you're doing um, any LTE deployments. You're doing four around the tower, you do 65s. And I'll show, show what that means here in a little bit. Uh, but here I'm just showing the different deployment strategies you can do. You know, you, you know, you start with your Omni for your low density deployments. You you start to dial it up. You get some more clients. You put up some 120s. Maybe you first start with two 120s back to back, and you can get pretty good coverage with two 120s. Um, you just angle them so it's such that your closest subscribers are near the uh, gaps here. Um, and then three 120s that can provide you your three complete coverage. Um, and then, like I said, with the 90s, you put four up around the tower. That's we give you great coverage. But you can get away with just three around the tower um, and, and, and still just try to angle them so your coverage is are, are weakest where you have the closest clients or the less, least amount of clients. Uh, and we can go down and down, 45 degrees these, and 33 degrees. These are the new, new guys on the block. They're the small angle sectors for your high density deployments. And, and 
I, I would say go no more than eight 45s. You're going to get way too much overlap. I don't think you're going to have that much spectrum to, to, to play with um, to, to do more than eight. Uh, six, you can get away with two um, because they're so high gain already. You're going to probably not see too much of a drop. Um, I know it looks like they intersect here about minus six, minus seven dB. But I mean, when you're going down from 20.5 to minus seven, that you're getting to 13.5 dB high gain. Uh, that's still a high gain. You're going to get out pretty far. Um, and then the 33 degrees, the same story here. We, we recommend uh, maybe eight, 10, 10 if you have enough spectrum space there. But I mean, this is two gigahertz and three gigahertz. You don't have that much spectrum to play with to begin with. So going down to uh, what frequency reuse one scenario. So this is if you have, well, you know, you can only have one channel um, and, and how are you going to do it? Well, I would say to try to get away with six 33 degree sectors on the same cha channel, you're going to have some overlap and some interference on the edges here. You can mitigate that by putting them farther away um, from each other, uh, maybe putting some, some RF armor on. Um, but but uh, this is probably the best scenario you can get uh, with 33 degrees at, at frequency reuse one. Um, and then if you go to a 65 degree, uh, it's recommended to do uh, th only three around a tower. Um, this is what buy cells kind of recommended to us and what we've been telling clients. It, uh, but once again, it, you can never get away with it. it every antenna is, is roughly the same. Is um, You're going to have some interference here on the edges. Um, and and You'll, you'll see that in your, your performance. Uh, for, for a 120 degree sector, you can go back to back on the 120s frequency reuse one. It might be possible. We, we haven't really recommended it too much. We try to say just do two different channels and you'll, you'll alleviate all your concerns, but uh, it's worth a try, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so frequency reuse two, it's, uh, so that means you have two channels to play with. So you can do four around a tower, 90 degrees back to back. Uh, four around a tower, 65 degrees back to back. You can see the interference where they're overlapping, where it gets darker. It's much, much less. So you're going to have much less issues with uh, any uh, self-interference. Um, and then the 45 degrees, you just always want to try to make it so it's um, either back to back or just adjacent to each other. So you see it's uh, channel one, channel two, channel one, channel two, and there's a good gap between them. And we only have to worry about interference here right at the edge. Um, and it's the same here with the 33 degree. It get, actually gets a little bit better because it's a narrow beam. So the interference between the two um, uh, same channel sectors is, I mean, we're somewhere around the t minus 25 to minus 30 dB mark. Now, well, back to the LTE, why do you want to use 365 degrees around a tower? Um, one of the things is just the interference. So here I'm showing, um, Let's just look on the right. It's four 90 degree sectors, and the red region corresponds to um, where the isolation between it, between the two sectors, is greater than I think it's 15 dB. Um, and you can see here that if, if these were all sharing the same uh, frequency, you're never going to get enough isolation between the sectors. The, only the green region has enough uh, isolation between each sector, and that's only 17 degrees. So most of your your um, pattern, you're going to have all this interference issues. <clears throat> but if you go and bring it down to a 65 degree, um, yeah, your 65 degree, you're going to have a little bit less gain on the edges. But because the 65 degree actually has a higher overall gain than the 90, so the 65 is a 17 and a half dBi gain, where the 90 is a 16.5. Um, and what does that mean is when you actually look at the edges here where they intersect, um, yeah, you're down minus what. When you look at here, it's normalized to zero, but you're down minus 5.5. But really, the, if you look at respect to the actual gain of the sector, you're at uh, minus 5.5. You're at 12 dB gain. Um, whereas if we go back to here, um, this is intersects at minus 3.5 dB for the 90 degree sector. So minus 16.5, minus 3.5, you are at 13 dB gain. So it's only a half dB drop of gain at the edges of the sector. Um, and, and the actual gain you see in the field by going from a 90 to a 65. So you're not going to see that much of a difference in the field, but you also improve your interference re um, uh, rejection. Uh, so we almost doubled our isolation region where there's at least 15 dB isolation between um, the sectors. Now, you're never going to get away with frequency reuse one with four sectors, even the 65s. What you have to do is three sectors. Um, and we can see here that uh, using three sectors, the interference um, between them drops drastically. We actually recover most of the band here, it's, or most of the um, um, sector here, 
uh, is now isolated. So about 97 degrees of arc is, is isolated here, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, if let's say you only wanted to provide 65 degrees of beam width and then not care about the gaps, then this is a perfect solution for you. But in any case, if you did want complete 360 degree coverage, uh, you only have to deal with the isolation in these small red regions here, as opposed to the uh, other cases, which those red regions were much great much uh, greater. Now the drop and gain where the intersect is minus 9.8 dB. So if we look here with respect to the max gain, we're somewhere around 8, 8 dB gain, um, which is, it was, it's actually not too bad. And uh, you know, that, that's about it for, for, um, for uh, choosing a sector. It, it's all about, you know, figuring out how much you're, you can spend, uh, figuring out the radios, number of radios you need first. And, and then which antennas, how many antennas will complement these these radios. So it, it's, you know, it's a, it's a back and forth game. It's not linear. There's an iterative process to, to figure it out at the end. But uh, you guys probably have lots of experience doing this already. You kind of have a, a trick to doing it. And uh, propagation studies help a lot. Um, they can get you very close to where you're going to be in the field as opposed to just, uh, you know, guessing and checking and trying it out in the field, setting down tilt manually in the field and re reading uh, the values off the um, the CPEs that their signal strength. So it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a fun adventure. But that's about it for for our talk here. Um, I think we're ready for the question period, and then also the question, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the skill question at the end. Good. All right. Nicely done. Uh, thanks, Justin. Yeah. Thanks, Justin and Michael. Not Kevin. <laughs> in case I confused anybody earlier. <laughs> <really. laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, just just so everybody knows, uh, please get your chat windows open. Um, we will be doing a uh, we will be doing the question for the hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Uh, I'll just give everybody a few seconds to do that. Um, we only had uh, one question come in. Um, are path loss antenna pattern files available, guys? Is that a is there yeah? We're, the we're working to get them on the website. Um, but you just send us an email. We'll send you the whole package for every antenna. Okay, perfect. Uh, so Ian yep. and I will, uh, Ian, I'll follow up with you on that, and we can uh, we can get that over to you um, ASAP. Yeah, that was a great question. Okay, and we'll, uh, all right, so I'm going to ask a question. We do have multiple choice answers, but I'm going to give it a few seconds and see if anybody can nail it without, uh, without the, uh, without the uh, multiple choice here. So <clears throat> everybody got their typing fingers ready. So what is the maximum drop in gain possible due to a mismatch between linear and slant polarizations? And you I'm going to read the question one more time. We yeah. got Todd, our buddy Todd from Saskatoon, the Paris of the Prairies. Looks like he uh, <laughs> he was very he was very quick. So we will uh, uh, we will Todd we will sync up with you. Uh, to, to give you that uh, gift card. Uh, was there, oh, there's one more question actually. Um, uh, what height on a tower is best for a 900 Omni? That I think depends on uh, levels of interference. Um, yeah. And should, and should be played with. So uh, you want to take into consideration the elevation beam width. Uh, with Omnis, it's typically a uh, very narrow elevation beam width. And so you use that along with um, how close your subscribers are anticipated to be or how far out your subscribers are anticipated to be. Uh, generally, when it comes to lower frequencies, uh, you want to keep the Omni lower on a tower uh, just to avoid any type of interference. In the U.S., a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of 900 is used for SCADA and automatic meter readers and this kind of thing. So in urban areas, it it really pays to keep the uh, Omni antenna low. But in rural areas where you're trying to reach out very far, it might be better to to place it up a little higher. Yeah, and and can I just add to that? Is uh, I was just talking to a customer um, today, and and they place theirs below the tree line so they can avoid interference with some other 900 gear that they have deployed. Um, but, but we've seen them mounted on top of water towers. Uh, so I think that's around, you know, the hundred, hundred feet mark, um, or maybe 75 and, uh, like, like 
like uh, Mike was saying, lower to, to is better for interference, but these have a 15 degree beam width. So you just d do your propagation study uh, with a one degree down tilt and, and figure out, you know, from that, those, those uh, beam widths and down tilt where, where you should be placing it. Okay. All right. Thanks guys. Yep. Okay. It looks like, I don't think we have any other questions here so we can wrap up. So uh, again, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank the gents here at uh, KP for taking the time to jump on really good information, guys. Um, lots of exciting things going on at KP and uh, the entire uh, infinite electronics uh, umbrella. I uh, see they got that slide up there. So there's a few different items there. Uh, MVSI Way, we do represent a few of them. So if there's any interest, please do uh, reach out. Um, again, we do appreciate everybody who took the time to hop on today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding KP or any uh, any other products that, that we carry, please get in contact with your sales rep here, um, and we can uh, we can absolutely get you any information on um, on the on the content covered today. Uh, MBSI Wave, we will be hosting some more webinars um, coming up here um, in the near future, so we'll be making sure to keep everybody up to date and, and sending those invites out to. Uh, to make sure that uh, nobody's missing anything. Again, this will be recorded and we will be posting it on our YouTube page. And uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest thank of you, the everyone. Yep. Enjoyed presenting today and uh, appreciated the opportunity from MBSI Wave. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.